Welcome bet riders around the world. My name is Gary Solomon and you're watching the laid back bike report. Hi guys, I'm so glad to have you all with us today. I've got a great show lined up for you. Let me tell you what we got going today. First of all, our featured guest is Lonnie Morse from the Oregon Human Powered Vehicle Vehicles. And that's an organization that's been around for a long time out on the West Coast. And we're looking forward to hearing lots of interesting stories about the history of that organization and, uh, and what's going on uh, today there from Lonnie. We have uh, Marco Rugo is back with us. Uh, Marco was with us a few weeks ago uh, to popular acclaim. Everybody loved uh, watching Marco and watched uh, his stories of uh, amazing recumbent builds. And uh, he has lots of interesting um, HPVs that he's been working on. We're gonna talk about his latest and also uh, some of the interactions that he has had on the road in Italy and how that might apply to the rest of us riding the roads with our bent. So we look forward to uh, bringing Marco back on. And uh, finally, highly anticipated segment, uh, Marshall Randall from uh, Whiz Wheels, Terra Trike is with us. And as many of you know, we've been talking about it for a few months here. Rider Fest has been going on, the virtual Rider Fest where folks have been out there riding, uh, keeping track on Strava. And uh, today, all of those entries from Rider Fest are gonna go into a big drawing that we're gonna hold towards the end of the show. And they're gonna pick a winner. That winner gets the trike of their choice from Whiz Wheels. And I'm telling you, that is a big, big prize. So stay tuned for that, it's gonna be exciting. We're also gonna talk with Marshall about the products that Whiz Wheels are, um, are, are making these days. And uh, we'll do an AMA as well, since we have them on hand as we've been doing. So if you have questions about your Terra Trike, uh, your KMX, uh, your Green Speed, or anything to do with those, uh, put them into the live chat and we will ask them. So with that, it's time to meet the crew. Yes, the famous dudes who help me out every week. Uh, we are so happy to have these guys with us. First of all, today's director from Colorado Springs, Colorado, it's Larry Seidman. Hey, Larry. Hello. Recovered from my Rider Fest ride. <laughs> I hope it wasn't a long recovery. That's great. Okay. And then down in Jackson, Mississippi, of course, it's the media dude himself, Trey Burgoyne. Hi, Trey. Howdy, folks. Good to have you with us. Down in Big D, Dallas, it is Mr. Wizard, Doug Davis. Hi, Doug. Hey, Gary. It's quite a workout to get down to that stop sign and back. Yeah, I know. I know. And it's the same ride all the time, isn't it? I know. I know. It's the scenery never changes. All right. A couple of mailboxes and a squirrel. Good to have you with us. And Doug's going to be handling, uh, if nothing else, he'll be doing some of the moderation on the live chat. And, of course, back with us this uh, this week is Peter Stoll, the Bicycle Man, down in Alfred Station, New York. Hello, Peter. Hello. Yes. I don't know if it's, if it's up in Alfred Station or down in Alfred Station. It depends on which direction you're riding from. Yes. Well, I'm trying to keep a certain perspective on things, and it well, may be the wrong perspective. Well, if you're looking with your, uh, with your uh, drone, it's certainly down, right? Right. Well, we try to stay up, so... Just Peter? say thereabouts from now on. Yeah, he's in New York. I guess that's good enough. What are you going to do, you know? New Thank York. you, Peter. Glad you're with us. All right. Let's continue, if we could, and we'd better, and talk about that live chat I was mentioning earlier. So, guys, this is how we make the show interactive on either Facebook or on YouTube. Uh, we engage with you on our live chat platform. So please, if you have questions, if you have comments, if you want to just interact with your fellow bent riders, or you have uh, want to ask something of one of our moderators, 
please put it on there. And if you have questions for our guests, even more so, put it up there. I'll see if I can't ask the guests the, your questions. And while you're at it, you guys already know, tell us where you're uh, watching from. We always like to see that as well. All right. Please support the Laid Back Bike Report. If you like what we do, here's how you can do it. You can like us on Facebook. You can subscribe to us on YouTube. And you can click that little white eye right up there. It will take you to our, uh, our website. And there you'll be able to find all kinds of additional information, our past shows, future shows, how you can buy a one of our baseball caps, uh, our podcasts, which we now are producing on most of our shows, the audio podcasts. If uh, you're out and about and you can't watch, that's another way that you can uh, you can follow us. So that's all important. Uh, and probably the best way you can support us is by becoming a Patreon patron. And if you go to patreon.com, look up the Laidback Bike Report, you will find us there. You can support us for as little as $1 a month. All right, so who else is supporting the Laid Back Bike Report? It's our sponsors. We love them. Let me tell you who they are. First of all, TerraCycle, makers of exquisite recumbent parts and accessories for your bent. And Trailside.bike, a fine recumbent bike shop on the Withlacoochee Trail in Florida. And Cruise Bike, designed for the cyclist who wants to ride farther, Climb faster and adventure more. All cruise bikes and frame sets ship free in the USA. And one of our guests today, Terra Trike. They would like to congratulate all the riders that participated in the 2020 Terra Trike Virtual Rider Fest. They hope that all participants are joining us live today to watch and see who wins the trike of their dreams at the end of this show. And the Hostel Shop, America's premier recumbent dealer with the largest variety of recumbents, parts, and accessories in stock and ready to ship to your door. All right, guys, it is time for our first guest. We are very excited to have this guy on. I met him in Portland uh, last year, although I have heard of his exploits in the recumbent world for a very long time before that. It is a pleasure and an honor for me to introduce to you Lonnie Morse. Hello, Lonnie. Hello, Gary. Lonnie, you want to uh, you want to unmute yourself? There you go. There you go. Great. So it is great to have you with us. We are going to talk today about uh, OHPV, right? Yep. They have quite a colorful beginning. All right, you know, let's uh, let's go ahead and jump right into the slides if we can. We're going to get all historical here, I think, to start out with. Lonnie, tell us about the beginnings. What is uh, what is OHPV and its beginnings? Well, OHPV is a. It started off as a builders racers club, and uh, it, back in 1984, a couple of guys by the name of Tom McDonald and Paul Atwood started, uh, they organized uh, some racing up in the Seattle area. Had to, there was a road race and there was also a velodrome contest. They posted out flyers. Well, that, was, that pretty well attracted a lot of guys who like laid back type bikes. And so they got together and on the way home, there was five guys from Oregon who decided to start at a club. And that was where OHPV came. And those five guys' names are, and I think that they need to be mentioned because they were the nuclei of OHPV, Jerry Jacobson, Greg Carr, Rick Pope, Slim Holman, and Alan Nikolai. Now, what you're seeing there is, is Greg Carr's build, and he was out-of-the-box type builder. He would build anything. And this is a, a true OHPV. It's a Honda-powered vehicle. So you've got your human, instead of human, it's a Honda power. But that's how out of the box that he was. And so things kept going and things kind of checked out. And then in 1985, they became incorporated. And that's where those names I mentioned there a while ago is who was on the incorporated names of the um, bike of OHPV. Here pictured is the very 
first editions of the Bob trailer, which was made down in Eugene. And I'd like for your viewers, anybody know what Bob means? Post it on the chat there so you can share that with everybody else. The B.O.B. Bob trailer, right? So everybody pretty much knows that. So let's see yeah. if we know what it stands for. Okay, we'll be looking for that. I'm looking on and out. So let's go ahead and uh, I'll come back to that when I see it. All right. They were also involved. IHPVA, which is International Human Power Vehicle Association, decided to meet in Portland, Oregon in 1986, I believe it was. And... They also covered uh, boats. And so boats basically became a part of human powered vehicles. And so that's an illustration there of one of the boats that was on the drawing board for OHPV. And I believe that was uh, done uh, by a builder out of California that came up and, uh, and tried it out in our Hag Lake, which is not too far from Portland. Next. Then Gunner is from Germany. He comes up. He visited Portland a couple times before that. Pacific Northwest was pretty active in recumbent bike and builders and racers. So he needed uh, some information for a new book that he was uh, working on. So it just so happened where he were up and running at the pretty good at that time. And then he got a lot of photographs and pictures and some information. Next. Uh, hang on, before we go to that, uh, you can go to the next slide, but in just a second, we have got, uh, how about that from Cat Karat, Beast of Burden? That's correct. The winner. You, that's <laughs> correct. Good call, Cat Karat. We appreciate that. Very good. Okay. It's the uh, hive mind uh, we call on to help out on the answers on this. So. <laughs> Very good. Okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead with the cover girl here. Well, this is where OHPV as we know it basically started splintering off into some other really crafty innovations. And there was a, a mother-daughter duo who started up a club called Easy Riders Recumbent Club. And uh, basically featuring the Easy Racers, Tour Easy and Gold Rush. And she happened to end up on the cover of Gunner's book. Now, this was the domestic version. The European version had a different picture of it. And if I could just interrupt for a second, Lonnie, actually, I mentioned to you I might do this. I did contact Gunner uh, on Facebook. I don't know if he's going to tune in today or not, but he uh, remembered fondly uh, making two trips to Oregon. You can talk about him a little bit. Uh, he is a German fella. And uh, well, I want you to tell everybody about him, but he finally remembers his trips to uh, Oregon and working with the recumbent uh, folks there uh, in the 90s, I think is what he said. So tell us tell us well, about I, the book and tell us what you know about Gunner. Well, I don't know much more than what you know because I've never met the gentleman. He was dealing with Connie and Lori when he was here. That's how they got to know each other. So at this time, ERRC, Easy Rider Recumbent Club, was a different club than OHPV. However, we were of the same members mostly, but ERRC was a recreational rider social club, whereas OHPV was the builder racers part of the club. So I cannot share a whole lot about Gunner from one-on-one -on -one information. Okay. Okay. All right, let's go on. This is at the beginning, and this is what, instead of calling them races, they called them musters. And that was a term that was came up early on the board members. And this is them out on uh, a church parking lot. And the, this is where the headquarters was for OHPV. They would use the church parking lot. They had an outbuilding, the church did, that let them use their, for club meetings. And they also were able to use the streets that were around the neighborhood there. Next. Finally, there was two people that got together, Jeff Wills and Mark Murphy. Mark Murphy was with oh, a uh, Electrothon America and they saw it happened to have Portland International Raceway reserved on Memorial Day because it was a quiet event. 
and Jeff and Mark were old friends from back in their California days, and they got to talking, and Mark says, well, you need to come out and use the track. We're only using it a couple hours a day. Why don't you come out, and we'll share the track? And so that's how our relationship with Electrothon America began, and we started holding uh, races, international races at Portland International Raceway, which was a 1.9 raceway, 1.9 miles around it with nine turns. And so it was a real fun track, very open. Uh, it was great for the streamliners. It gave them some wiggle room. I have to say for the slower racers though, we did hear complaints about being out there all by themselves. So it was kind of a, so we made it into a short track. We cut it in half and uh, made it to where everybody could kind of play together out there on the track. And this was our registration booth set up. Little sponsorship from Schwabi there. We did. They sponsored some tires for us for a few days. And then, and this is a poster that basically explained all the events that we had. And you might notice that we also had a, an e-bike rally, which was we were trying to get e-bike racing going back before e-bikes really took off. And we did it for a couple of years. It never, it never gained traction, unfortunately. We were kind of disappointed. But it all comes down to timing. And our timing was just a little bit too early. Yeah, let me ask about that. Lonnie, so here's our buddy Mike Mowat, who was on the show a couple of weeks ago, um, talking about the racing in um, actually in the Midwest, of course. And one of the things that uh, Mike talked about was some of the future possibilities for racing and to build up more racing these days was to do a, an e assist uh, race. So I'm sure he'd probably like to talk to you about what you did there. But I guess my question is, so uh, obviously the, this is more like motor racing to some extent than uh, human powered racing, even though there's certainly human power involved with e-assist, but it, uh, has, it would have a lot to do with what motor you had, the size of the motor, uh, the wattage and all that sort of stuff. So would you have different categories? How did you set up the e well, we started. We did not have different categories at first. It was all about how much amp hour was used okay. in a time window and so when you break it down to the amps then you're talking about it's it's a it was a race for efficiency then right the that, best, I, I see yeah. i see that yeah, for the time we had a one hour race and it was all who could win the race were on the least amount of amp hours used okay well that makes a lot of sense that's all about the building and and uh, the quality of the electronics and such okay all right let's go ahead so this is what we're all about in a new look. And we've evolved out of racing. And if you'll get a shot of me, notice that the streamliner has oh, yeah, been yeah. replaced. Just come on back a single shot on okay. uh, where I eat the wood, Larry. Yeah. Here, let me get that for you. Notice that the streamliner Again. has been replaced by a high racer. And that is because we kind of move a little bit to your left there. Yeah. Center yourself up and a little bit higher so people can really see that. That's it. Okay. See, we, we changed it out. <laughs> there yeah, everything's go. backwards, I know. Yeah. And put a high racer in there because we felt like it was more representative of the times. And we were running out of steam for racing. We we were losing racers. No, no young blood was coming into the club and the builders were starting to lose their interest in building because you build racers. That's basically what we did. And so we've evolved into a more social club ourselves once like ERC was. Okay, let's go on to the next shot. This is a young para uh, T-cycle. That is a young Pat France. Patrick France, look at you, man. That was yeah. uh, that was a couple of years ago. Yeah, and, Earth and Cycle was the sponsor of our show, of course, and this is a very early shot of that. On the table there, you'll see they make underseat racks. They make pannier racks for recumbents, and that's a whole table full 
of wrap material during production. Very cool. And this is, uh, we had an invitation to be able to go out and ride the uh, Velo, uh, Velo Drome and um, you know the bike the bike community the club basically they tolerated us but they really didn't uh recognize us for what we were doing and of course of of course they didn't like it when they got spanked on the track what and, so tell us this is a what velodrome is this Lonnie, this is alpine rose velodrome in uh beaverton oregon i mean that is a severe slant on that track though. you didn't you you didn't dare get up on that that turn unless you had momentum, and I'm just working up to it right there. I'm that's you up. on that's you on the track, yes. Yeah, that was my first t tour easy with the body sock, and I have a, a a pilot. I'm a pilot, so I have an aerodynamic background of interest, and so. The body sock was something I just naturally gravitated to. I could understand the whys, and I refined it. And uh, what was interesting, I found that a lot of body sock riders were aviation enthusiasts. It seemed to just magnetize them to the body sock. That's really funny that you mentioned that because we've had this on numerous occasions. We fairly recently talked to Ben Goodall down in Australia um, with TriSled. And of course, he is also into um, aerodynamics. And of course, he's a pilot. And he talked about that as well, how pilots seem to be drawn to this. And I know of quite a few myself. So that's, that is kind of amazing. All right, let's continue on. This is a Bill Stites prototype low racer and it demonstrates his Bill Stites mid drive and it works especially well for front wheel drive. Yeah, let's, before we get on to that, can we go back one please Trey? Cause I want uh, Lana, you pointed this out to me. So tell us how you fit on this, on this vehicle. How does that? Well, happen? you wear it. You don't go over and get on it. I am sitting in a sling seat and the tubes, there's one under each arm. So you step into and slide down into a sling seat when getting into that bike. Okay. You, so you actually get down in it. Yeah. And, it was, and the, the fundamental of it was, it was kind of it had a mindset at the time. We were building streamliners at that time. So it was a, it was a bike that was, kind of vision, having a vision of going into a streamliner shell. Okay, now let's, it's, it, that's that's the frame part of it. Now let's yeah, go to that next slide. So this is very innovative. Tell us uh, uh, about this, this. Well, the purpose oh. of this drive is to keep the chain line straight. So you have a U-joint, it's under the tube there, but there's a U-joint that transfers the power from the left to the right to the wheel. So those chain lines remain straight no matter if you're in a turn or not. And it just ups the bar on efficiency of a front wheel drive drive line. So now I uh, you didn't really tell me about this when we chatted earlier. So what he you told me that there's a patent on this and do, is there anything that's in production or was in production with this uh, mechanism on it? Not to my knowledge. Now, Bill got, kind of changed direction. And he started building uh, heavy-duty pedal slash e-assist trucks. Uh, they were three-wheel trucks to use around like shipyards or industrial sites. And so this drive found its way into some of those products. And so, because they were on a trike type of uh, platform, but they were also e assisted to carry those extra heavy loads that you need in the industrial area. Okay. Let's go on back to the slides then. That's uh, back to T cycle. This is our very first carbon fiber class hosted by Pat France. And that's Pat in the background. And that's Tom Breedlove, a past president, who is also a very, very uh, advanced builder. And he was the 
probably the first club member to, to be involved in EOSYST years, years ago, years ago. But we're cutting carbon, carbon fiber there. We're about ready to lay it up. That's a Jeff Wills pulling on the rubber gloves there. Very exciting time in the history of OHPV is when we started getting into building our shells for our chassis. And the next series uh, of slides as, that we're coming up to now actually is all about that. So as we go through here, tell us what's going on in each one of these and what stories go with it. Well, we're learning how to cut and shape carbon fiber that's been cured here. We're trimming it up. And no, you notice there's a, um, a hose there sucking up the carbon fiber as we're grinding it off to make it safe. It's a vacuum. Next. Now we're getting into laying up our streamliner shells. And this is the club. Uh, there was five shells laid up. Robert Johnson, who's uh, on the left there, we're in the basement of his home. And he taught us how to lay up carbon fiber in molds. Now, Robert has past experience with building a ocean going catamaran. He also, my career was a ship captain and he captained freighters across the ocean. That's what he did for an occupation for a lot of years. So that's his background. Jeff Wills and I are laying up a shell there and there's Robert looking it on to make sure we're doing it well. We're laying in the resin right now. We're not squeegeeing it out yet. Lonnie, we've got a question from Michael Smith about uh, breed love. Was that the same breed love that set the land speed records? That is a relative, shirt tail relative. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay, back to the slides. Now we're getting into the part to where we're squeegeeing the excess resin out, making sure the air bubbles all out of it. It's elbow deep in resin. It's not, it's not, it's fun, but it's messy. And so, but we were all having a good time and talking about the upcoming season of being able to have streamliners out on the track to race. Next. Now we're laying in Kevlar. Now these liners have to be made to crash because you will crash in them. And as, as I was learning to drive mine, boy, I was so glad that I had Kevlar inside because as you're skipping down the track like a Frisbee, you're burning through that carbon fiber. And the Kevlar is the only thing that saves you. And of course, the Kevlar keeps the carbon fiber from splintering out if you ever hit anything like uh, a barricade or anything like that. So it's uh, those uh, streamliner shells have to be made like crash helmets for both the rider and the bike. And here we are finished up. This is my shell. And uh, we've got it spaced out so it's the proper size and shape whenever it cures. Next. And here it is on race day. And I, of course, I'm a happy camper. Haven't been out yet. Notice that shell is all nice and pretty and shiny. And so uh, that is a home-built Zox clone frame, front wheel drive with a mid drive installed on it so we could get the gear inches to do 50 miles an hour. Next. It took getting some use, getting used to, to all that machinery going on right by your crotch. That took some use to getting used to. It was noisy and also the chains were pulling the hair off my legs so I hadn't shaved my legs. I did the next day. I had shaved legs. Next. This is getting staged up. They're about ready to put the top on and I'll be taped in shortly. Uh, a note that, there we go, is there, that mid drive, that, that uh, sprocket that's facing us, that's a bikey tandem chain ring with the crank arms cut off of it and dressed down. Next, it takes a crew to get you taped in and started. You notice in the background, 
There's a streamliner also. That was uh, the big gun by Steve Dallaire. There's another Varna uh, shell in, behind him. And then you have a tandem easy racer with so socked up right there. Now, Steve Dallaire, if we can pause for a minute, um, Lonnie. So D Steve Dallaire is noted uh, frame builder. He worked uh, with easy racers and built some of those, yes? Yes, and he was also the manufacturer of Rotator, which is one of, I had one of his bikes, and it was a very fun bike to own. Yeah, he's yeah. a big Next. name in the history of recumbents. All right, let's continue. This is the other streamliner. We had a varnish shell, a mold that we were able to acquire. And uh, this is Robert Johnson, and he didn't fit in his. It's not uncommon not to be able to fit inside the narrow width of the streamliner. And so he put a lycra. He cut the his out, and so he just filled in the gap with lycra. And he put a zipper fairing upside down on top to be able to get the bike ready for track. And there was a lot of 11th hour sleepless nights on that last couple of weeks, getting these bikes ready for PIR. Next. This is, this is me going into the turn that I had crashed twice on. Uh, it was a high speed turn, but it, it kept getting tighter. The, the further in the, the, the turn that you would get, the tighter the radius would become. And um, I just simply took it too fast the first time. And then the second time, the wind blew me out into the outside of the turn. Next. And there's what your racer looks like after you've been down a few times. And you skip down the track like a Frisbee. You see the damage on the side. Can we pause for a second? I've, I kind of skipped over. We were talking about uh, Bill Stites and where that uh, hub uh, front-wheel drive might have been used. And Charles Kilt says, could it have been used on the chameleon leaning trike? Do you know anything about that? The chameleon trike, yes, uh, it could be. The thing, the reason that hub didn't end up being used a lot is because it was patented, and no one else could copy it, so no, and, and produce it. But to be able to buy it, it was pretty expensive hub, and it was for home builders. It was basically out of our range and so that's the reason i didn't use it is because i couldn't justify the cost of what it would take okay and I can't, you can't blame a man for wanting to get recoup some of the cost on production but for sure that's the reason you know uh, edna van gundy uh, we were looking at that uh, picture earlier uh and we mentioned steve delaire and he says and she says uh, looks like joe kochanowski behind steve yeah Dallaire. he was known as crazy joe by the group and he was actually in the very first beginning of the seattle uh tribe up there and he did some crazy things with streamliners uh, one outstanding thing i can say he had a a streamliner called a Moby, and he did STP, which is Seattle to Portland, which is 200 miles. He rode to Portland and then back halfway to Seattle to join us one day riders at night at Chehalis, Washington. So he rode one and a half. He rode uh, that would have been 300 miles when we did 100 miles. And Lonnie, uh, David Rockwell says, crashing sounds like fun. Was crashing fun? What was, tell us, uh, let's be more specific. What was it like to go down sideways on? Well, go back to that, go back to that sli slide that showed me beat up there, yeah. that one. The, I burned through one of that spot, that hard point right there, the middle one, right below the canopy. That's where my shoulder is. That's my arm. That's the oh. imprint of my arm you can when see I'm that. on my side. And yeah. the darkest part is I burned through a hole through the shell. And it burned me, my wow. arm. Now, when you're on your side and you're sliding out into the grass, you're down on track vision. Your, your eyes are like maybe five inches off the asphalt, maybe six. And that grass looks like a row of trees when you're sliding into it. I'll bet. And then when you hit the grass, 
it really it's slippery. You just take off. It's like you're you're sliding now. It gets quiet because you're off the grind of the asphalt, but the grass less really friction, so you're moving. You're moving. Well, you'll go down, you're doing about 35 to 40 miles an hour. Yeah. Okay. Let's catch back up to the slide. Yeah, there we were. What's so this? This is the chassis that was in that streamliner. I did not like front wheel drive, not for riding on a wet track and going in and fast turns. I felt like I was asking that front drive wheel an awful lot to be able to do my directional touring. I couldn't pedal through the, the uh, turns at high speed because I would lose traction. And so I decided I needed to go to a rear wheel drive platform. So I sold the bike that was in that streamliner and he put a rear tilt mechanism on it. So he made a tilt trike out of that bike. Next. And this is the uh, uh, hardware that he used for tilting. And he, the reason it has two quick releases is that that could be installed and, and removed within a minute out of the bike to convert it back to single track. The two quick releases makes it so it's a, adjusted or to the frame so you could run 20 inch wheels or 700 C wheels. That's, that's to make that tilt mechanism space further away from the seat so you could run a 700 C. Next. Now as home builders were basically, we didn't have all the fancy jigs and all the we were building mostly off of particle board jigs. This is my jig that I had made. And then this is my plumbing instruments on degree angles and all. But when you're using six different, three of them are gravity, the other, the other three are bubble, you got to get make sure they're all dialed in and, and uh, working together. So you set them up on the jig table, you get your jig table zeroed out, and then you check your instruments. And out of those six, two of them are out. And you can see the one in the middle says two right. That means it's two degrees right out. And the one on the one of the others I found to be one degree out. So I marked, oh, there it is. It's on the right. So <clears throat> it's important that you have all that dialed in together. So when you're jigging things up and, and plumbing, everything is square the way it should be. Next. This was year three on the streamliner. I'd fared in the wheels. And I'd also put a rear wheel drive low racer and it was a um, Zephyr low racer. Uh, worked perfect, had a, a little bit of a rear suspension and uh, the Zephyr was known for, to have mild manners for low racers. And that's what you need when you're in a, you can't use any body language. You can't catch yourself. You gotta have something that's mild mannered in the, in the handling characteristics. So it worked out really nice. Behind me is Todd Marley. That was the first year. I guess this would be second year probably for the liner because Todd finally got his out on the second year. And Todd, with his Dreamliner, held every time trial record. Road record, time trial, and two states, or Washington and Oregon, with his Dreamliner. But Todd configured his because he was a a broader across the shoulder. He couldn't fit into his either. So he had to modify his and he put gull wings on his so he could get his feet out to catch himself. And it was very much like the coyote streamliner that uh, um, Dean Pen Penderson had for a few years before it got totaled. Yeah. So Todd, I followed Todd pacing him as a pace vehicle and he's done 50 miles an hour in that streamliner. I never had the watts to be able to do that in mine. I only got mine to the 49 on a, on a straight road. I could never get it up to high speed on the too many turns on Portland International Raceway. Uh, my, there's the last year. I had that for two years. It was all tight, buttoned up. It ran great. 
didn't have to do anything for the, at the last year I raced it except air the tires up. That's all I had to do to it. But I was, there's Todd. He's, he's screaming down the straight. And that placing, that number one, that's a position that he earned that for several years. Now, you can kind of tell that he's got a zip of fairing modified for the canopy. And that whole side that looks a little bit rough there, that gull wings up and his feet come out. Now, this bike was designed for time trialing. We had to design that bike to where we could get it turned around in the width of a two lane blacktop. It had to turn 180 degrees in a width of a two lane blacktop. So what we did was that we made doors at the front wheel and you can see the little white lighter color mark right above the front wheel. That is a hinge. And when that wheel turns, no, lower, Gary, down, there you go, right there under your cursor, down lower, right there, that way. That is a hinge. And when the wheel turns, it pushes the door open. And it's the same, works on the same uh, concept that when Todd pushes open the doors on his streamliner, he's able to stick his legs out and to be able to catch himself. It's truly a self-starter. And, uh, and bungee cords is what holds those doors together. Once the wheel straightens up, the doors come back in flush to the body. The very, very roadable streamliner. George Jib was just unbelievable. He couldn't believe that our liners could turn around in the width of a 200, I mean, a two lane blacktop. This is the man that started the body sock movement in uh, the Northwest. Uh, we were talking about pilots a while ago. This is a retired U-2 pilot. He retired from the Air Force, and when he was in the Portland area, he was a captain for a major airline here. And when he showed up with this at one of our club rides, I was just all over I just loved this bike. It was one of those things, I, I got to have one. I got to have one. And so... And he was athletically fit to make that perform just like it looks. It was a very fast bike. John, Captain John Zimmer is his name. Next. The girl here is Lori um, Smith, and she formed a ERRC, Easy Racer Recumbent Club. And um, this is... The all of us, there was 10 of us that met up and we rode down the coast. Lonnie, so, if I could interrupt here for a second, seems like a good point uh, to kind of take a, a quick break. So we have talked now rather extensively uh, about the build and racing aspects of the club, which are obviously very impressive. And then I guess just to give people a handle on the, the, everything that this club does and stands for, there is a huge social riding touring component that uh, is part of the history of this club. I think that's where we're going now. Um, yeah. Before we get to that, just to clean up a couple of last questions um, from uh, Mike again. Uh, you probably already answered. Did Todd's bike have a dual sided landing gear, i.e. wheels on both sides? It was his feet that came out as you were his talking feet about, right? Come out. Yeah. He may have he may have asked this before you got to that. So uh and this is kind of a reiteration here. So uh, yeah, so, uh, there was a question earlier about uh here it is about uh speeds. You mentioned that you were able to get yours up to 49 and Todd got 50. Was that was that the highest speeds that you saw? Well, we raced on we raced on um uh, at PIR and with all the turns, you're not going to go any faster than that. So all of our bikes were gear inched at 50 miles an hour at 90 RPM. So yeah, they would go faster. In fact, George Jiv told me personally, he says mine would be a 75 mile an hour bike. If it had a good motor, <laughs> I'm not that motor. And also we would have to redo the gearing, but he said it would do 75 miles an hour. So that was quite a compliment. And he, 
I was complimented the fact that he liked my build of his yeah. of his body shape. Nice. So the reason I mentioned 49 and 50 is because that's all that's all they were geared for, for the track. And that's all they needed to be because of the nature yeah. of the track, as you say. Yeah. Okay, so let's leave the racing for now then. Let's go ahead back to the slides. Uh, and and yeah, so now let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, the club in terms of its riding uh, and its touring and its social aspects. And continue on. Well, Gardner made sure that the... It, too late, unfortunately. Gardner Martin of Easy Racers, he actually seeded the money to get e ERC up and running, but he didn't want it to be all about Easy Racers. He wanted it to be about all recumbents. So the club name changed to Easy Riders Recumbent Club. It was Easy and, Racers Recumbent Club, yes? That's what ERC yeah, was. Yeah, a very, was. very short period, the beginning, and then he got changed. But Mostly easy racers were what showed up, though. It was because it was what was being promoted mostly. And that was one of the more popular recumbents um, at the time in the Northwest. And we had a dealer that was selling them. And so Lori uh, set up this tour down the Oregon coast. Now, anyone that knows that touring down the Oregon coast, that's an international first class tour route. It is, uh, it is recognized the world over is one of the premium. And so she said, we need to do a tour. And I said, count me in. So in 2000, we got 10 riders together. And there was a, there was a couple of other branded bikes, uh, as you're seeing there at your, to the left. And I do not recall what that bike was. It was under steering, so it had to be. Is that be Orion, a, maybe? Is that a long wheel base? I, it, I think it might be. And okay. he towed a two-wheel trailer, a, a burly trailer with that. Okay. And so... The rest of us were pretty much easy racers, tour easies, and gold rushes. Now back to the Velo, uh, Alp and Rose Velo, Sam Whittingham happened to be there for a bike ride, an upright bike meet, and Laurie talked him into sitting on her gold rush. Tell Actually, everyone who Sam ride. Whittingham is. Yeah, that's the Sam Whittingham that broke the, held the world records for so many years in the Barna Streamliners. Next. <laughs> The story on these three ladies is the, this is the Golden Girls, and these were small, petite women. And Connie McHale of ERC, she talked Gardner into making three custom bikes just for them. And that was that they wanted, they needed to be light frame bikes. They were going to make these bikes as light as possible. Well, they're all small frames and smaller. I think one was, the longest one was a medium small and the other two were smalls. And so they were made all thin walled aluminum and just for these women. Next. And Maxie, bless her heart, she couldn't wait to, for hers to be so to be shipped. So she drove down and she picked hers up, and that's Gardner Martin talk, talking to her. And that's when she took delivery at Easy Racers. And that's the legendary Gardner Martin, as you say, uh, the founder of Easy Racers, the the most popular long wheelbase recumbent, uh, uh, probably to this day, I would say, even though we'd have to say at this point, uh, long wheelbase uh, recumbents aren't as popular as they once were. Uh, this is the guy that started it all and uh, an amazing fella in his own right, obviously. Yeah, and you won't see him clean shaven very often either in most <laughs> pictures. So that's a rare one there. So. I asked him, I said, did you just shave specially for Maxi to, to, when you, she picked that up? And he kind of gave me a, a Cheshire grin, you know. All right, next. This is with, uh, this is Connie McHale's uh, Golden Girls edition of a Gold Rush. And as you can tell, it has the Roth paired spoke rear wheel, has 451 front wheel, all the speed stuff. Ronnie, uh, Connie was a, a, used to be, an upright rider, and she was a pretty salty roadie category. That, so that's one of those frames that we saw before. That, that's it. Yeah, that's the reason she was wanting the a roadie. Mm -hmm. All right, next. She was also responsible because they were putting on some social rides. She came up with a, a another organization called Portland United Recumbent Rides. 
And the reason she did that is because a lot of people really don't want to join clubs. So you kind of see where she was going here. She was trying to get politically correct back before PC was PC. And so she basically came up with this Portland United recumbent rides to attract other riders that had recumbents. And each year we had an Alice P. Toke Clips banquet. And it was all about awarding special awards to uh, dignitaries um, uh, that did uh, above and beyond type of bike promotion. And it was all about the infrastructure of the Portland metro area and the state of Oregon. And we would buy a table and uh, join the festivities of the banquet. And it was a pretty big deal. Even the uh, politicians would come and speak at this banquet. Next. Back to Easy Racers, I uh, had designed my own tail frame for the body sock and was showing it to Garden, Gardner. And he said, he just basically took a pause and he said, I'll be darned. He said, look at this. And he, that's his personal supercharged Studebaker Hulk. And he says, look at that. And he's, behind, yeah, behind the, uh, the, the tail sock right there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he was just, he was really humored at that. My tail frame resembled the tail fin on his car. Maybe we should take a second line and explain the tail sock, the, the purpose and the nature of it. The tail sock, my design was to get it off the shoulders. I didn't like the Lycra laying on me like another jersey, like wearing another jersey. So I designed one to lift the sock off the shoulders. And this is a good shot of it. You can see my shoulders is not touching at all. You see a little bump on my elbow. That's the only part of my body that's touching that sock. And so it makes it so air circulation comes in up, comes in from beneath. And it comes up in my chest, right up over my shoulders, and it exits out the back. And it's just like riding in the shade. Nice. Okay, let's continue. This is a race that we have on our local in-city limits extinct volcano. And it's a crit, and it was put on uh, by the local bike club. But they let all the recumbents race themselves together and so what else is new huh so so this is our group our racers group all taking off and heading uphill on that crit on mount Tabor. next we got involved in cycle oregon cycle oregon is a 500 mile seven day supported tour and erc got got um, jerseys for us all. And so this is a cycle organ crew. This is how we turned out. And we're on one of our training rides here. It's where we all go out to the coast and we have a ride out there and we, we call it the cycle organ training ride. And the Anchorage Motel happened to be one of our clan. And she wrote, she also rode a tour easy. And so she brought us out. We'd all stay there at the, her motel and we go down on the beach and have a big, big uh, clam roast and uh, had a great time. Clam bake, I guess it would be. So next. This is a Christmas party, a OHPV Christmas party. We would always have anywhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 40 people show up. And this is where the annual awards and also the annual club meeting of election of officers. And so this is. This is just an example of some of our groupies, both racers and socializing. Next. In that party, we would we had musicians and they would bring their guitars and their, their horns and entertain us. Next. And you better have a computer booted up because we're, we builders are online and we're gonna be looking at a lot of different building diagrams and and suggestions and what's new. And aviation mentioned again, you could see the model planes hanging from the ceiling there, Lonnie, huh? <laughs> yeah, that was my office. That's where that was taken. Yeah, that, the, yeah, that, those parties were taking place. You mentioned to me at, that was actually a space in your house. Yeah, I had a big, 
big place. It was all lofted out. So I had 7,500 square feet in this place. So uh, that was lots of room for us to have a party. All right. Yeah. Let me take a second here, Lonnie, because I don't we don't really have a specific picture about this, but you had mentioned to me, I don't know if you're going to be talking about Rome. Uh, the viewers of this show are pretty well acquainted with uh, Joseph Janning, the uh, German fellow who is all about Velomobiles and has been on the show many times. And Joseph also put together a Velomobile ride uh, in 2011, I believe, called uh, uh, Rome. And uh, you played, uh, your group played a part in that. Maybe we can stick that in right here, Lonnie. Tell us uh, what you know about Joseph Janning and Rome. Well, we, we uh, basically set up the logistics of being able to, for the start, not, not getting them here. That was on them, but they needed help getting a route established. And what was the best way to get out of Portland? Well, there's no easy way to get out of Portland. And so they basically, they came to me and our club did. And I said, well, let's just go ride. So we went on a ride and we rode out as far as we could to out into the Columbia River Gorge and um, had getting that group of Velomobiles through a, a highway, interstate highway 84 tunnel at the Bonneville dams is really going to be a challenge. Uh, the scenic highway was too hilly, and then there was a staircase that you just, it wasn't even logical to carry velomobiles down. So it was uh, basically, we were going to go through that tunnel, and it was high traffic. And so we contacted uh, ODOT, and they weren't for it at all. And then it came around that they were going to have to buy a pass or a, to get it uh, all shut down. And so Basically, we critical mastered. That's how we did it. Uh, we just basically told them when we were going to be there and we were going through and they basically freaked out. They shut, they shut down the freeway and gave us the whole freeway for about six miles. So you and made a spectacle of yourselves, but it was an effective, uh, it was an effective way of getting them through the tunnel. We basically, how we did that, we basically just cut off communication with ODOT. They were going crazy trying to talk to us, but we wouldn't return the calls. And okay. we told them when we were going to be there and when we were coming through. And they brought, they had the big heavy equipment out there, the barricades, the barriers, the highway <laughs> patrol. And we went through there and uh, no casualties, no incidents. Uh, and so it worked and it yeah. didn't cost us a, uh, I think that permit was four hundred dollars or something like that, and we just basically what I said: critical mass to, with velomobiles. Very good. All right, let's get back to the uh, slides and continue on. Again, there's Pat France, and then we had a rising star racer, the blonde-haired guy there, Mike Wolf, and then John Clamaldi was also a very strong racer of ours. Yes. Next. Okay. Remember I said I had a rotator? Well, this is the rotator I had, and then I bought it. It was actually a coaster bike meant to be rented out as a rental bike for the boardwalks. And I bought this hanging on a hook as a frame set only, and it was a damaged frame set at Easy Racers when we had a, a Return to Freedom event at Easy Racers. And I talked Gardner into selling it to me, and I brought it home. And I updated it. Remember, this is only supposed to have a coaster rear brake so as a rental bike. And I upgraded it to a multi-speed. And then I put the aerodynamics on it. And I really liked working with that coroplast. And by the way, that's to get the compound turns, you use two millimeter, not four millimeter. And you can really do some nice turns with it, curvatures with it. Next. And by the way, that that rotator was just as fast coasting down beside body sock gold rushes. It was just as fast. This is our club member's hand, foot, bike, recumbent bike, and uh, he was he was he was an animal on this. I mean, it was uh, separate to where you could get it. Uh, 
it was an independent drive. It wasn't together. And so Jay really made that thing fly and it was refined well enough that he made a titanium version out of that. And he rides that today with tail sock. Next. Uh, this, is not, this is not the first recumbent retreat, but it was pretty early in the years. And I want to point out, notice all the fairings and all the bikes, the recumbent bikes for this event. So the yes. so we make sure everyone understands. Recumbent retreat then was another event that uh, OHPV put together, and this would have been approximately what year? Uh, recumbent retreat first year was. Uh, I'm gonna have to think about that, but okay. it was early in the year. I would say two, around 2000. That's fine. Okay. Let's okay. Go to the next one. And then uh, it's a social group, and this is what's evolved into today. All those fairings, there's still about a half dozen fairings that show up and other recumbents. We'll have more than 10, but you'll have close to 90 track trikes show up for that event. And this is what we are today. Social, our demographic has gone into three wheels for many reasons, for obvious reasons. And that's... Uh, you know, you don't want to fall and hurt yourself anymore. And I led this ride around the park, in the park, and then this is out along the Columbia. And Sylvia Halpern talks about recumbent, among other things, recumbent retreat all the time. I know she's been a big, uh, we're going to show a couple of things here in a minute uh, with Sylvia in it and what part she's played. But uh, it's an um, it's an important part of of the look now. And, and it's interesting to see how it's evolved over the years. Okay, let's go ahead to the next one. Next. In the recumbent retreat, we have a lighted parade, and it's been, it is looked forward to each year. Uh, it is a spectacle, and we tour every loop in the state park. And even the staff, the, re, the uh, park staff, it look forward to this event. And people will uh, book their camping reservations, making sure that it is on the same date that we are there so they can get to watch the, the event, the parade at night. And so this is a, a picture as an example of, of the uh, lighted parade. Next. And then a, a few years ago, I put on another ride called the Sunset Ride and it's held late and we ride out to the beach and we watch the sunset. And then I try to make it to where we're riding back in the twilight. And so that's when, you know, Satch decides to make a visit to some of the riders. And uh, we made sure to, to talk to the park staff so they wouldn't freak out with report sites of Bigfoot roaming around the park, but it was a big hit. And here you're seeing uh, a mom and daughter who basically caught on to the fun of it and got a a picture with him and the dog really didn't know what to think <laughs> okay let's go on to the next one here and this is another tour down the oregon coast uh we had a series of tours and so i was i outfitted two of them and so it's it's something that i encourage anybody that's a distance tour don't miss the oregon coast best time of year september do it in september you'll have tailwinds the uh, tourist traffic is is gone. So that's the time of year to do it. Next. Uh, Connie McHale talked me into displaying the bike and, and this was at the Pedal Palooza event. We had a, a booth uh, and so she said she wanted to display the bike. So this is what we ended up doing. And so it's all about an exhibit and promoting recumbents. Next. This is where Sylvia comes in to the play. You know, Sylvia got her starting as a world traveler at Recumbent Retreat. And uh, she was a group of women. They were called the Bitch and Bent Biker Babes. Next. And this is the gals. And you'll notice that uh, they all were on trikes, I believe. I, there might have been one. I think there was one of them that was on a bike. So and that's, that's Sylvia off on the far left there. Yes, that's Sylvia off on the far left. And 
and the rest of the gals were all, they weren't locals. Uh, they've all kind of spread out and gone, but uh, they were, and this is kind of what's when the, she left the rest of the group and she continued on down all the way into California. And I think she ended up into Mexico on that, that ride. She has told us that story. So yeah, she started out with these women to ride, uh, the recumbent retreat and then continued with these ladies and then left the ladies and continued on into Mexico. And that was basically, she can correct us when we talk to her next, but I believe that's basically the start of, uh, of Sylvia's travels, travels by trike. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This is an example of riding around in Fort Stevens park. I mean, we have, it was not uncommon to have 30 to 40 trikes in my ride. And we had like four different rides going simultaneously. And uh, I had to have somebody middle and we were all dispatched by walkie talkies to kind of keep the, everybody together. And we had the guy on the run and sag telling me those who would leave and, and uh, going back to camp and all. So it was just a matter of, this is a kind of a regroup point. So. Next. This is who we are today. We're a fun, lonely, happy group. We're very diversified. In fact, that's Jonathan uh, Garcia there to the left of Rose City. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, and uh, Pat France is the light green shirt in the middle. And we're, we're out celebrating the opening of the brand new bridge that we're standing on that is a bikeway out in the Columbia River Gorge. And so today we're a social club. We don't, we don't race anymore, uh, but we still do a little bit of buildings. Uh, I, get the, I get the itch every now and then, but you know, I keep myself from doing the scratch. And so I'm more interested in doing a solar uh, platform right now, solar assist. That would, if I was going to build, that would be the next build that I would do. So that's it, Gary. There we go, Lonnie. So uh, let me just finish up with uh, one last question. I don't know who would be a better person to ask than you about this. So you've been around the group for so long and participated in all the different iterations of the group and all the different, the building and the riding and all that stuff and leading the groups. So you told us about the past and now you brought us up to date. So how do you see the future, like the next four or five years? You, know, you just mentioned uh, solar power. You may be working on that. Mm -hmm. well, how do you see the group um, changing now over the next five years? What do you envision? Well, eAssist is going to be a big player, uh, not, not only for a demographic, but also for it's putting a lot of people that health-wise they could never ride if it wasn't for eAssist. And that's a big demographic still right now. That's the baby boomer. And we're all aging at the same time. So what do I see in the future? Because we're not getting any new blood, we, I think the E-Assist basically is what was saving the bike industry before COVID. Now, COVID has, has done a real good job of repromoting the bike industry. But E-Assist really was well on its way of getting interest back into bicycling. And so hopefully we'll be able to attract the younger mid-age group by having E-Assist, by being able to make those distances more easier. You know, we're not all natural athletes. Those of those who are athletes, my hat is off to you. I never was a high performance athlete, but I was always a competitive sports car racer and a motorcycle racer because all you had to do, it doesn't take a whole lot of strength to press the accelerator and hit the brake pedal. And the skill set I had in racing, I was able to bring it in to bike, but I never had the power to make my racer perform up to its full potential like I did when I was racing cars and motorcycles. And so e-assist is the game changer. It does two things. It allows you to ride the way you want to or you always wanted to. And so it, it, you can get out and pedal and get therapeutic results from it. 
you don't have to hurt yourself trying to ride be a, above your level and that's the thing there's a lot of de of uh, of uh, damage to the muscles and tendons that come from overexertion because we are on a bent platform we have something solid to push against and that takes a toll on knee joints and my demographic there's a lot of knee joint replacement out there as well as hip. And so E-Assist, again, is going to bring them back into the saddle and they're able to get a, another lease on life yep. uh, riding their bike. So the answer, I think we're going to see more come back into bike because of just what I said. No doubt about it. Well, Lonnie, thank you so much for sharing all those wonderful stories. What a rich history. Um, uh, we don't have time to get into it, but we did talk briefly when our, in our planning session about the club archive that Pat Franz has, uh, the <laughs> material uh, at uh, oh, TerraCycle. <laughs> and I think that's really interesting. So I know you were planning on getting back into that. So when you do and you find more to talk about, get back in touch, stay in touch anyways. And, and we'll get, we'll have you back on and we'll talk some more about some, uh, some of the more interesting stories that uh, happened for OHPV over the years. Does it sound good? All right. And Gary, thank you so much for having this channel. It really oh. is appreciated. Thank you. My pleasure. Of course, Lonnie, you take care. We'll see you soon. Okay. All right. Okay. Bye-bye. All right, guys. That was Lonnie Morris, OHPV. Uh, interesting stuff. All right, now it's time for us to uh, head to Europe. Let's go to Italy. And uh, I think we will find our pal uh, Marco Ruga and Sophia. Yes, there they are, looking good. How are you guys doing? Hello. And thanks. Hello. Do you hear us? Because we have some issues with the microphone. You look better and sound better than you did when we practiced. So this okay. is great, Marco okay. and Sophia. Very nice to have you on. Have you back on the laid back bike report. We're going to do a little bit, uh, something a little bit different than what we did last time. We have a couple of very specific discussions we're going to, we're going to handle here. And the first uh, part of this discussion has to do with one of uh, your latest builds, uh, Marco, and how you uh, have evaluated it, and uh, you do a great job of doing that. So if we can, let's go to the first picture, and I'm going to turn it over to you, Marco, and tell us the story of the evaluation. Uh, tell us about this bike and the evaluation of it. Yes, we are starting with the upright uh, standard bike because I've made some tests, and I'm so lucky at the moment I have found, uh, let's say, a velodrome. Thank you, Larry. Well, thank you for the welcome. Um, I found a velodrome near my house and it's a very uh, big fortune because I didn't know it was there. I, I know it was there, but uh, I didn't know it was always, always open and uh, free for every, everyone. So I found it and so I have taken this uh, fortune uh, with my bikes. So I've taken there the common bike, the standard bike in and all my recumbents to test them with the power meters. So the, it is the, uh, the first test just to know um, the speed versus power. So I have made some tables and my last videos are about this. Um, the aim, of course, is to confront, to com compre uh, compare all the bikes. And uh, um, uh, the main thing is in this, uh, let's say, velodrome, I can uh, compare perfectly because on the roads it is not like that. On the roads, let's go are, to the next slide because you mentioned yes. the velodrome and also this is the velodrome on the other side. So this is the gate. So I took uh, in the last days, in the last weeks, my uh, it is called the Rev. It is my let's say I Rev because it is the highest version. So I compared it uh, with uh, wheels. Uh, uh, the um, in inclination, the inclination of the seat, uh, how I, I can put my hands on the underbar and so on. And now I have many data uh, just for racing or just to, to know how uh, the different bikes behave and how they perform. So better, not better and so on. And uh, the main, the bike I am testing is the road bike, this iRev, and then next, uh, I think the next photo, this is a, I have two versions of the HTH. The HTH is, a, let's say, a low, low racer. 
HTH means uh, uh, this uh, stands for I wait well because uh, uh, <laughs> my, my <laughs> it's it's like a, a bike that could be very hard to drive. Actually, it is not so hard to drive. So L, so dangerous. It is not. But this is a version of a 26 inch version. It is not for me. The the guy in the in the picture is my great friend Mino, and uh, we are we have tested it last week. And uh, comparing it with the uh, 28 inch uh, Rev HTH, the one I brought uh, with myself at uh, the World Championship, and I was fourth uh, at that uh, championship. It was you're I referring to this Mino right here, Mino 73. Yes, he is he is in the picture there? You see Mino with his uh, Formula One pedal car, and uh, I took him to the, the recumbents, uh, unfair recumbent. He's a, a good athlete, he's not the top, but uh, the aim is to know uh, if uh, uh, an athlete, uh, a rider that hasn't, uh, hasn't practiced a lot with uh, four-wheel drive, four-wheel drive, can drive that bike, because it could be an issue or not. Actually, it could. So we, we made some, uh, a table with all the data, and it is, uh, I think, quite interesting. So maybe in the next um, next photo. Yep, let's go to the next slide. Yes, it is well. It is Mino. Here we we see uh, how the low racer is um, can perform well, uh, even with the, the guy that spoke before. Uh, we, we saw some picture of the low uh, some low racer. Low racer is, uh, I think, the best way to go in the track. Uh, because it it is uh, faster than uh, a traditional, let's say, traditional recumbent. Because it has, as you see, the front uh, area is, uh, is is less than you know, all the other bikes, so it is definitely faster. Mm -hmm. And next, here we see the velodrome. It is not actually velodrome. Velodrome, I call the velodrome of Gattico, but uh, actually it is a track around a uh, rugby rugby field, and but it has some banking let's say it is just bends uh, a little so it is not dangerous till you are at 50 kilometers per hour let's say 30 miles an hour after that uh, uh, it is just you have to pay attention not to go <laughs> outside of the track but uh, it's good it's not like a, let's say here in Italy we have the vigorelli in milan it's not a professional one but i can it, i can use it to compare my bikes very easily and all the values are the same. Let's say the wind can corrupt up a little the values, but uh, um, they are very precise. My power meters are very precise. So I, if I take some parts, uh, different parts, I can, uh, um, I know uh, the behavior of each part. So it's very, it's very good for me, for ride and for the races, of course. And uh, yes, it's unbelievable. Mino has written, it's unbelievable how he, everyone, can take uh, 40 kilometers per hour easily on that bike. It's unbelievable. It's so nice. And uh, for, with the with the, the uh, 28 inches, it's uh, even easier. It's even even easier. But the thing I want to know with this test is even if it is uh, rideable or not. Uh, so even the 26 inches is uh, good to, to to drive. So here I am with my my bike. It is a first step. At the moment, I'm making some let's say um, something to make a better performance step by step. So I will know how to. I think I I, I hope to make it uh, to a better performance to take it to a better performance. Here it is. Uh, uh, I've taken this picture because it is a picture taken for taken for a Saoki Saoki video. I think you know Saoki, very famous uh, YouTuber, and it's taken um, when he, has, he has, didn't have the power meters. He has taken th this table just to compare the, the, the mobile to the low racer and so on. And the curious thing, but not curious, but nice thing, I think, it is that uh, these values are very. Uh, close, very near to my values. So I think the, that velodrome is good and my power meter are also good. So it is a good starting point to make my research. Let's say research. Then next one. So you have, you have seen all the values. 
and they are very close to these values. As you see, my road bike, uh, of course, we have some different values. Uh, I always use the uh, power meter at uh, 20, uh, um, 250 watts because I think it is a good, uh, good value for that can be reached by, let's say, any athlete, so any rider. So uh, as you see, these values are very, very, very close to the others. And what I want to underline is that uh, the same bike with, without any aero advantage, let's say, gains five kilometers per hour from the standard bike. But the recumbent, as we all know, I think, is just faster in the lower version. So with the seat very high, with uh, the ends on the handlebar, not the rear, and so on. And so it can gain a lot, let's say two, three kilometers per hour from that point. But the low racer, the 28, is definitely extra fast. Because with 250, I, I am I am at uh, let's say 46, nearly 46 kilometers per hour. It means 28, 29 miles per hour. Maybe it is not. What I want to underline is maybe it is not the fastest low racer because I've seen some other values of other low races. But uh, we must take in account, and that is my my study. Let's say that the seat is at 27 degrees. So it is not horizontal, not, not, it is definitely not horizontal. Um, why I've taken this, uh, this, um, these degrees? Because in that position, as what I, I'm, I'm considering at the moment, in that position, I can put more, much more power than when I'm completely horizontal. And I will test uh, all the different values of, uh, let's say, um, seat versus power in many conditions to know the relation. I think uh, there has been many studies about that, but for recumbents and uh, for for this kind of, of low racer, uh, they're not very clear. Then I think I must add some very clear values for me and maybe for me, you know, because you know, of course is my tester. So for a good, let's say, good trained uh, guy and a normal guy like this, you know. So we can compare these values and I think we, we know something that uh, could be interesting. Right. So but, this, is a, this is a starting platform for you. You've got yes. a great start, clearly. And this is what you're going to, you're going to start tweaking uh, the, the angle to see where you get the power and the aerodynamics matched perfectly. This is what you're going to end up doing. And you've got this velodrome. You didn't mention this, but you told me earlier that's uh, very close to your house now. So it's very convenient for you to change, go out and test, change, go out and test. So you should be able to get some decent progress in the near future. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. At the moment, at, with uh, 300 watts, I am uh, close, let's say, uh, I am at 30 miles per hour. But I think I will gain some speed with some modification. So if you want to, um, to follow all these steps, I will, of course, show them on my YouTube channel. So I think it could be interesting for everybody because I will explain what makes what. And, and, and let me reiterate, is. folks, uh, we, we, told, we, we, we told this to you uh, the first time that Marco was on. He does have an amazing YouTube channel where he explains everything that he does, shows everything he does as he works, and we would encourage you to watch uh, that as well. All right, I think uh, we're going to leave uh, this here, uh, Marco, and mm -hmm. let's move on to our second subject, which is uh, equally as fascinating, if not even more. So, Marco mentioned this in our first uh, in our first get together about everything that goes on in the street while he's riding. He doesn't just build and test uh, recumbents. He is an avid uh, rider, commuter. He's out there as an advocate to ride his recumbents uh, out on the streets in Italy. He doesn't have a lot of good things to say about uh, riding a bike, and he's gonna. We're gonna talk about that now. Now, Marco's put together um, a couple of videos, short videos here, and we are going to have a look at them and talk over them. Uh, Marco will be telling us what's going on. You're gonna hear some interesting uh, conversations uh, during the video. Uh, you're gonna see some uh, 
you're going to see some biking hand signals that you may not be familiar with uh, in the U.S. I think uh, that will be an education. And um, and some of the conversations in Italian you may not understand, but I think uh, the tone of the conversation. Say. Yeah, the, I think the tone <laughs> of the conversation is clear. And, uh, and if you need to know, I think Marco will translate. So, Larry, if you would... Let's go ahead and uh, and Marco, you'll need to unmute yourself as soon as this starts. It will automatically mute you. So be ready to unmute yourself as soon as this starts, okay? And okay. let's go, Larry. Così tanto successo sui social. Okay. Are you, are you there, Marco? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So this is a video that became a, a viral in Italy. This and another video with the upright bike on the famous Arona bike lane, as you see. Uh, it is it shows the behavior of pedestrian italian pedestrian so this is i want to underline this is a bike lane so actually only the bikes can ride on this lane but um, as as you see as you see the sidewalk um, the, um, the sidewalk is free yes the sidewalk is free and the bike lane is full of people and the, the curious thing is that they know they cannot stay there because uh, uh, I, you don't understand maybe what they're saying. They're saying, um, attention, attention, it is a bike lane. Okay, okay. we, we are uh, going on the side. So they know they cannot stay there. They cannot stay there. But anyway, they stay. And, and uh, I felt in danger. Uh, yes, uh, uh, me too. Because uh, as you see, you, can, you cannot go. So this came vi became viral in, in Italy. In uh, it is a video of January, and uh, because uh, every people uh, understands that something is going wrong in Italy, as we see here. I, <laughs> um, as you see, I, I've um, I said something like, uh, "What what a mess! What a mess!" So these are many examples, many examples I have taken from my YouTube channel in which I got, I, I'm getting every day in danger on the Italian roads. Actually, he is my friend, the school bus driver. Every day I met him and every time he, he makes me in danger. So I think, uh, I think there is not a solution. Here is another 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 example, as you see. Yes, he overtake, overtook me with that distance at let's say six uh, uh, six uh, six uh, sixty miles per hour, so very very fast. But what I want to underline with all these videos, I maybe you can see uh, what is happening, is that the Italian behave is. Uh, um, let's say not strange doesn't care of the other doesn't care of the other it is a, a thing that uh, you cannot change at the moment in this in this way as you see the car uh, didn't stop uh, didn't stop at the crosswalk so it is not uh, under uh, it is against the law i did but that prius let's see it overtakes me and then turns on the right on my side another example overtakes and turn on the right. There are thousands of examples every time, every time I go on the road because I, I commute every day. And here is uh, again the school bus. Yeah, this is my friend, just to underline. Here I am on my with my with my Formula One pedal car. And um, it is not a matter of vehicle. Uh, if you use a combat, maybe you are safer, you can be safer. If you use a standard bike. You are not, but, but, hold on a minute. Have you heard that? There is uh, the limit, the speed limit of 50. It was, uh, I think, uh, over, over 60 miles per hour. So uh, my question is why, why do you, do you go so fast just uh, while you are, you are getting on? Another example. Let's see. My question is, okay, he is overtaking me. At which speed? Let's let's see. This is just an example. So which speed? There is a 50 kilometers per hour limit here. It is 30 miles per hour. He reaches 110, meaning 70 miles per hour. So 
on a road on a road where everyone can can be hit by a by a car at the speed that will be killed the question is why italians do behave in this way and the answer is uh, it is something that uh, matters with educational with uh, the, um, i think uh, the mentality the actual mentality of italian people cannot be changed and uh, there's a god the car that stands above everything everything if you are a pedestrian on the crosswalk you always risk if you are a biker maybe more and uh, another uh, thing i want to underline a biker in italy is not someone that uh, commute that go to work because for example in my extra big uh, op work um, factory we are at 500 and only three four let's say four people uh, go to work by bike so uh, the bike is not uh, a vehicle so the bike is just a bike for racing so when so you bikes have a very low status is really what you're saying the status is low for bikes and uh, bikes and pedestrians clearly from that first yes. video they just it, it, they're just like in, it's more than inconsiderate they are they just don't even regard them as, as important but, but the funny thing about the video that the hot topic uh, let's say viral video is that uh, that there were in the comments and also let's say uh, on the newspapers there was the pedestrian are against the um, the, the car the, the car uh, riders and the car riders are against the bikers and the bikers are against the pedestrian so it is all a mess everybody against each other so we, we cannot uh, have a common idea at the moment at the moment for share for sharing the road right now let's this is interesting so gork 57 uh says greg contrast this with the netherlands now we know that the netherlands has incredible biking infrastructure and the the bike is king there and the cars are secondary and this is really i, I don't know that's probably what it would take uh to to get things to change let's uh not get too deep here i want there was a question about have you been in an accident associated with a car and we'll i see. think that, <laughs> that will we'll lead see. us right to the second video so Larry, we'll see. We'll see. Ready? let's go ahead and don't forget to unmute yourself when it goes here okay, okay. here we are mm -hmm. so it is uh... <laughs> let's see the music yeah the angels are singing yes go ahead <laughs> because why because it is the first time in thousands, thousands of miles that the cops stopped me. So I have the camera luckily on and I recorded all the, all the things. So what I wanted to know is what they think about me, what they think about that vehicle. So uh, the answer is um, you are road legal. I know you are road legal. Okay, so good. Okay. But uh, at the moment he's saying, do you care about your life? And I answer, yes, I care because I use this vehicle that is very visible because it's very strange and I have lights on the back, on the front, so power and so on, while all the bikers have got no lights in the night. But he's telling me, you are so low, you are, you are so low. Yes, you are strange. Yes, you are road legal. But the issue is, what what do you how can you think that uh, so, these people that are always on the mobile phone while driving can see you so the issue is not the vehicle the issue is that on the roads are always these crazy people so he's telling me change your mind because you are street legal you are okay for me i cannot say anything to you so go go I, I i cannot make any anything to you but and this is the picture of my let's say it's uh, like a velomobile for a wheel velomobile uh, here you see lights and so but uh, my question is that that could be your your uh, your aim so you could be the guy that uh, will convince people not to use the mobile phone but the answer is 
there's no no way to change the things this is another another video we were uh, stopped um, at the ray crossing and we were stopped for many minutes so all the people were angry so the, the contest the the, um, the main part is that all the people were angry and i know i knew that we were angry this is a, the first overtake and uh, he was telling me something that I cannot translate. And there was another guy that overtook me, and he told me all the st all the things. So I felt in danger. I was on the side of uh, of the street just to be safe. And that guy that was so in a hurry that he had to to overtook me, overtake me just to be to be to be uh, a sooner at house in, in his house he had all the time to to argue to to say something very bad to me but uh, what i want to underline is that uh, i was very calm i took my camera and this is makes a huge difference i took my and uh, i'm telling him what is uh, your idea against me why you are against me and uh, he answer in uh, this in this uh, way uh, I have nothing against you, but uh, with your bici di merda, that uh, means uh, sh shit bike. <laughs> so, uh, it is the common way of seeing our bikes in Italy. Uh, you are so low and you cannot be visible. But what I answer the, in the video, I answer so, you cannot see a, a baby, a guy, a little guy um, that is crossing the road. So. Will you eat that guy? Will you eat that baby that is crossing the road because you cannot see him? It's strange, it's strange. But uh, I'm telling you all these things, uh, but there, there's there's an end of this, uh, of all this, because uh, um, I tell you that it, nothing. <laughs> Coglione means uh, uh, moron, <laughs> and. Uh, in that moment, I was so angry with him, and I'm telling him, uh, go home, please, because that's it. <laughs> you have a lot of problems, I, I'm telling him, because at the moment I was so angry. But everything that I'm showing you is not just uh, to let you know that there is a, a problem that cannot be solved in Italy. And this is my bike, of course. What yeah. I'm telling you is that, uh, and this is a conclusion, that there is a solution. There is a solution. And the solution came to me, to my mind, when I had my last accident. It was not definitely the worst of all, of all times. I just hurt my, my arm, we'll see in a few seconds. And I had some uh, issues with my leg. I had a month with some pain. But the thing is, if I want to, uh, to use the bike, I can use it just uh, if I follow some some a line, uh, just just some some things. The thing, the main thing is, think as you, as you are invisible, as you have never the right in roundabouts and in every time. And if you want to be safe, check not once, not twice five times every time you are not sure to cross the road so um yeah the the friend before the friend before from holland is a completely different world i went to holland i went to germany i went to all the countries in which people can ride safe they have bike lane we in my in my that black arona bike lane is the only bike lane in miles and miles and miles and the problem is the only bike lane in which I can go with my bike is gathered with pedestrians. So it, it, it is a even mess, a complete mess. Help. Even that doesn't help. So, right. I, I think uh, your, your point is a great one. And the situation you're in, it probably goes for everyone. Uh, unless everyone. you're in a country where it's very safe. But you never know. You look you look multiple times. Don't always assume that, that there's a car coming at you from a direction you can't see. So keep your head on a swivel and assume that you are invisible. No invisible. matter how many flags you have and how bright you are. Flags. Uh, uh, lights and so on are good are good but they 
do not change anything because people see you. What I, I told them is, if you don't see the potholes, don't see me. So do you do you go in the potholes because you don't see the potholes? I am I am higher than the potholes. So what's what's the matter? What's the problem? Right, right. But there is the solution is that you are invisible. Always use your mirrors, and maybe, maybe in the future, will something will change, and could change even if you are very polite. Every time, every time we have the dog. That was the same hand <laughs> we used for that driver, as I'm mistaken. All right, we we have to we have to finish up the here. last one. The last one. Yeah, so we have a we have one last video, Larry. If you're ready to go, and this is uh, don't forget to unmute yourself. Let's see this last short video. So it is my biggest uh, crash. I I am at the moment at 50, 50 km per hour with a 50 km limit. That van is it went very close to me. Uh, let's say one meter, less than one meter, and the tail, the tail, the um, slipstream of his tail just went on my front wheel. It was, yes, a front wheel full covered, okay, but it is not a matter so big. But the problem is, if we see, I, I did see that one, I did see that can, that, uh, that uh, vehicle, uh, but I went just on the middle of the road to be safer. Uh, something like, I am here, please don't overtake me, don't overtake me. There's another car coming from the other side. You, here we see, there was another car from the other side, but it decided to overtook me, the bike. You see the other car. I was on the speed limit. I was 50 km per hour when there's speed limit of 50. But uh, he didn't care. He didn't care. As you see, he has to go to the right very soon because there was the other uh, car coming. And they, I was not lucky because I went on the side of the road where there were some sharp uh, stones. Some stones uh, finished on my were were found on my arm, and so I was hurt. And uh, as we see, my gloves and my uh, other stuff was not <laughs> in a good condition. But yeah. but this episode also told me a lot. Told me a lot. If in that situation the driver overtook you on that vehicle, I, I had the flag, I had the light. You see in the video. There's no way you can be visible or you, you, you can go on the road safely. So after that, I told myself, I have a family, I, am a do I have a daughter, and so I will uh, go. If I want to go fast, I go to Gatico circuit because there's a velodrome that is waiting for me and for my test, and that's it. If I want to go to work, I will, but I will just take... Uh, not very, not, not roads with traffic and so on. We make a, a, a great, um, a, a many kilometers more, but it's not an issue because I will train more. And on, in the winter, I will not use my bike. It's a pity, but uh, that's it. But maybe something is changing at the moment. At the moment with coronavirus, we have um, some money, monetary incentives. So some people is getting a new bike. So maybe there's some space for new bike lanes in Milan, in Rome, in big cities. They are, are building some bike lanes and new bike lanes. So there's way for something. I don't know. And maybe when people will know that going by bike is easier, the convert or not is not important, is easier than going by car, maybe something. To say. Maybe the next generation will understand. I don't know. Let's hope so, Marco. Let's hope so. What a great evaluation of what's going on there. I think so many people around the world can identify with the problems you have. There are, as you mentioned, better places and there are worse places, but uh, certainly we all deal with this and you're making um, prudent uh, changes to keep yourself safe. You have a family and uh, of course you have to do those things. So 
let's hope. Let's hope let's that hope, let's hope. this generation there will be uh, more of a push for people to be out and 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 using uh, bicycles as transportation uh, and, and people expecting to see bicycles being used as tra transportation. I think that may help as well. So we're going to have to probably leave it there. We have to move along. Marco, thank you so much uh, for coming back on. Uh, I hope you're going to be a regular pal. I'm going to have you back. I will have a lot more to talk about. And uh, it's great to have you on. And Sophia, great to see you again. Hi. So uh, take care of yourself. We'll see you again soon. And if people want to know more about you, we'll send them over to your YouTube channel and they can watch what you do there. Thank you very much. Okay. Always a pleasure. Ciao. Ciao, ciao. Okay, guys. All right, it's time to move on to uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, where we are going to Whiz Wheels and meet up with our uh, pal. Um, let's see, we have we have Marshall. There we go. We have Marshall and JC here at Whiz Wheels in Grand Rapids. Hi, guys. Hey, hey how's it going? We're doing just great. The uh, show runs long as usual. Thank you for being so patient. And uh, we got a lot to get to here. Lots of exciting stuff, uh, including a drawing uh, for a trike of your choice from that Rider Fest. We're going to talk about that at the, at the end. We have an Ask Me Anything session. So let me just say right now again, if you have questions uh, for Marshall or JC about anything to do, with uh, a green speed, Terra Trike, or a KMX. Put those in there uh, in the live chat and we will bring those up to them. But uh, for starters, if it's okay with you guys, how about we go through the lineup of your products so people know what it is that uh, you guys make? Sure thing, Gary. The only thing I would throw out there in front of that, I just want to give a shout out to like all of our dealers and customers that have hung in there with us. Uh, through these very interesting months that uh, we've just gone through and uh, it's been fantastic for us. And I hope it's been the same for some of those dealers. So Absolutely. thanks. And I think we'll, yeah, we'll probably get into the talk about uh, what you guys have uh, experienced and how things have changed uh, with the coronavirus as well. Let's start out though with uh, the slides. Can we go uh, Larry to that first slide? And uh, let's let's start out with the TerraTrike models if we could Marshall. Sure. So uh, what you're seeing on the screen there now is uh, the Maverick, and this is our entry-level uh, trike. Uh, it was new last year, getting to most dealers this year. Uh, it's available with an internal three-speed hub, as well as an external uh, eight-speed. And then coming soon will be one with a new uh, Enviolo hub. Uh, the price range on the Maverick is $999 to $1599 with that new Enviolo hub. Okay. And I can go on to the next slide. The Rambler, also new for this year. Uh, the Rambler has an increased wheelbase this year. And also you'll notice it has 24-inch wheels all the way around. It's an external nine-speed trike. Uh, retails for $17.99. Uh, again, new for this year. Our first shipment came in and left just as quickly. Within a week, we were out of them. But no fears, we've got more on the way. So we can go to the next slide. The Traveler. Uh, the Traveler has been in our lineup uh, for a number of years, but new for this year is a single fold. Instead of having the Outriggers fold, it is a single fold trike. Uh, that makes it a lot easier for our customers to fold. The rear wheel now nests between the front wheels and it has folding handlebars for the first time. Uh, the Traveler retails uh, for $22.99. And again, uh, we have a shipment coming in very, very soon for these. And so we'll be able to get these out to dealers within the month. And I can go on to the next slide. Ah, the Gran Turismo. Gran Turismo was kind of the darling of the uh, Terra Trikes uh, in 2019. Uh, it does carry through uh, unchanged for this year. Uh, it is a touring trike specific design for that purpose. Uh, all of our uh, storage solution bags and racks fit the Gran Turismo. Uh, it's available as an X18, an external 18 speed, and retails for $2,099. We can go to the next slide. 
Terra Trike All Terrain. So Terra Trike All Terrain uh, features a very wide gear ratio. You can see it's got 24 inch tires all the way around. Uh, Schwalbe Smart sand tires, very aggressive tread. It's built up to take you anywhere you would like to go. Uh, features the same frame as what the uh, uh, Rambler has and the same as our EVO, which is in the next slide. So the EVO, uh, the EVO was new for last year with the uh, Bosch system. Uh, features the Bosch Active Line Plus motor, Curion controller, 400 watt hour battery, and then of course it has that Bosch best in class uh, motor on it. Has been incredibly popular, and Bosch is such a great partner for us. Uh, certainly, as I keep saying, it is a best in class system. Um, it then takes me into you can stay on that slide, but I should mention that. Uh, in our uh, e-trike lineup, we also have the uh, Bosch Boost, uh, which is a kit that you can add to uh, any of our uh, Terra trikes. And I shouldn't say any, let me back up. It's available to fit on the Maverick. It's available to fit on any of the Rambler frames. It's available to fit on any of the GT frames. Um, and people have been just loving that ability to add an e-system with that reliability to many of their Terra trikes. And we just released uh, the boost system for the Rover. I think we kind of announced it to uh, RCC last year that it was something like 16,000 Rovers are out there in the marketplace. And so this will allow those people to put a Bosch system on their trike. Um, that's a quick rundown, very quick rundown on all of the Terra Trikes. Um, I've got JC sitting here beside me who's going to take a run at the green speeds, but I should note that uh, Terry Groen, who's our uh, sales manager for Green Speed and KMX, unfortunately couldn't join us today. He was scheduled to. He's running a temperature and, well, coronavirus and all, we definitely want to be playing it safe. So we said, stay home. And thank you, JC, for stepping in and yeah. and carrying that uh, torch, if you will. Yep, thanks, JC. All right, let's go. Yep. We're going to go to that first slide, JC, and we'll um, yeah. start so talking. To the first uh, trike on the lineup here, uh, we have the GT20. Um, if you're looking for a touring or a commuting trike, this is a wonderful option that we have um, featuring 20-inch scorcher wheels. It's really um, easy to ride, um, quick to get on and go. It's um, a very lightweight aluminum frame, and it's also a folding trike and comes in around 37 pounds and has a five inch adjustment in the seat height. So you can get that variation if that's what you're looking for. Um, features 24 speed um, and retails for 2,690. Um, so we can go ahead and move on to the next um, trike here. We have the GT20 RS. The RS you see stands for rear suspension. So if you take a look at that rear wheel there, you can see the suspension in the back. Um, again, the GT20 RS has the Scorcher 20 inch wheels. Um, it's very quick, nimble, and easy to ride. Um, again, lightweight at 39 pounds. Um, it also features the five inch adjustable seat height and is also a 24 speed. And the GT20 RS comes in at 34.90 retail. Now we can go ahead to the next slide. All right, here we have a look at the X7, one of um, the faster, more sporty green speed trikes we have in the lineup. Um, it's incredibly fast, comfortable, um, really low sport trike with a rail-like handling to it. Um, features 16-inch wheels all around and great for roads and bike paths. And um, it's really ideal for transportation as it has a nice um, folding size. Um, and it also features a 10 to 15 inch seat height, um, which is again great to have that um, variability. And the X7 comes in at also um, 3,490 retail. We can go ahead to the next one. Next up, we have the Magnum XL. Um, the Magnum is a wonderful trike because it's very suitable for both on and off road use. Um, it's got those Schwalbe Big Apple tires on there. 
which are really wonderful. Um, it has a high weight capacity and is taller rider compatible. And um, it's just really great for touring, community, uh, commuting, and um, just handles really well. Um, the Magnum XL retails for $3,290. Um, we can go ahead and go to the next slide, please. All right, the Magnum Big Wheel. Um, here you're seeing those big old 26 inch rear wheel on the back, um, which is where we get the BW for big wheel. Um, it's a folding aluminum frame. And again, it's suitable for on and off road use. Um, and the Magnum Big Wheel retails for 3,490 as well. Uh, we can move on. All right, taking a look at the Anura, first thing you'll notice is um, this is the only Delta in the green speed lineup, um, which is a really cool option to have out there for people. Um, it has great steer uh, steering and handling. It also offers a more upright seating position and a higher seat and um, light steering and can actually be coupled together for tandem riding too, if that's um, something you're looking to get into. Um, the Anura retails for 2,990. And we can move on to our last green speed here, the Aero, certainly not least. The Aero is the fastest trike on the market. It has a 20 degree seat angle, and everything about this trike is designed to be slippery and fast. Um, it uh, has great hand position and steering, um, carbon fiber wheel covers. Um, it's got a set of 16 inch front wheels and a 20 inch wheel on the rear. Um, it features those scorcher tires, and it comes in at a very light 31 pound, which is going to help you really get that speed on your ride. Um, the Aero retails for 4490 and so that's kind of a breakdown there of the green speed line that we have here. Um, lots of cool trikes, and we're excited to have our hand on. Very good. All right. Let's, um, that's great. I, I think that really gives folks a handle on the amazing uh trikes that you guys have out there really pretty much something for everybody and I, I don't know who would say that those aren't reasonably priced in the trike market today so awesome stuff all right let's get uh, right into the ask me anything we've got some questions to deal with first of all maybe for jc are there any fat trike options i guess to come in the green speed line that you're aware of Yes. Yeah. So one of the interesting things is, and, and notice how quickly I throw out, yes, we have a prototype that we're working on that will uh, be showing at um, RCC. Uh, it's going to go out for uh, exclusive uh, demoing uh, next week. Um, and I think I'll kind of pause right there. Um, the... Um, Big wheel does have the ability to come down to a 24 inch wheel in the back and then you can go up in tire width and you can do the same uh, on the front uh, wheels as well. So you can get up there to around a three inch tire on the uh, Magnum uh, BW. And, and that's gonna be a pretty exciting platform for us to build off from in the future. Very good, all right. Next question, and actually we have an answer in the live chat. It may not e actually even be an answer for you guys. Is a Turtle Trike seat cushion compatible with other brands? Let me put the answer out here that was on, and you guys can add to it if you like. So Matthew Hobbs, thank you. Turtle Trike seat cushion has fit onto the Trident seat and normal Azub seats. Do you guys have anything to add to that? or? Not really. I, you know, I, I would say that's probably something that we haven't experimented with. Yeah. Right. Of course. Yeah. It's, it's, it's yeah. about other, other trike brands. Yeah. So yeah that works on other ones. Good to know. Thank that you. Is, that is important. All right. Here's a pretty specific question from BJ Ando. Uh, why does the direct steering setup have to be so stiff for the handlebars not to come loose on my uh, Terra Trike Traveler? It's because of the plastic bushings instead of the brass bushings I had on my Tour 2. Any so, response to that? I think so. Yeah, I think this is one of our riders from this uh, participated in some of the rider fest. But anyway, um, to answer his question, it's going to depend on the year of his traveler. Some of the travelers had a bushing bushing combination, 
We had the bushing on top and the bushing on bottom. We've since gone to a bushing bearing uh, combination, and that's a lot easier to adjust that stiction, if you will, that you get in the steering. Um, sometimes it's a matter of uh, working with your dealer and just dreaming out the inside of that bushing ever so slightly if you do have the bushing bushing combination. Otherwise, it should be pretty easy to adjust with the bearing set at the bottom. All right. We have a question, actually a couple of them here from Mike Mowat, uh, uh, another guy up in Michigan. Have you been approached by the Ask Me teams for sponsorship? They had the Ask Me competition last year here in Michigan. I think, Marsha, you know about this. This is the American Society of Mechanical Engineering, and they do uh, they have teams of colleges from around, actually from around the world, the country especially, that race in a competition and, and building competitions uh, for yeah, uh, bikes and bikes? Every yeah. car. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So I'm familiar with it, but the answer is no, we have not been. Uh, I look at the events and I see that they're having, I think, weekly time trials up there uh, again, at least starting sometime soon. So uh, short answer. Um, we haven't been, we'd love to have anybody stop by. Uh, so Mike says the lots of ask me teams build trikes. They might benefit from visiting you and seeing the lineup of trikes that you have to try out. Uh, and they might be able to use a trike or two to train on while they build their own for competition. He, yeah. he suggests. So he said he's encouraged teams in the past to contact you. So maybe that will happen, but thank you. Yeah, Mike, it, was, for that. it was interesting. I want to throw in just in all of our conversations with Ben and stuff, you mentioned him earlier, kind of that vein, you know, like, Buy a recumbent trike, whatever brand, you know, to help you train for these events. Sure. All yeah. right. Here's just a comment. Green speed with true tank steer and with drum brakes is so great. Mm -hmm. great. Uh, okay. Um, Adrian says the Sportster wasn't uh, mentioned. Is it going away? Yes. Okay. <laughs> there we go. The, the last of them uh, were shipped last week. All right. And Jay Knight, who are, you're going to hear shortly, is going to be on the show uh, next month. You didn't mention a terrific trike, the Tandem Pro. It's a great tandem. Yeah. What we, about we, the tandems? You, yeah, you didn't. Are, are, you still do this, yes, the tandems? Yeah. So tandems are – we're one of the few still making them. Uh, it's a fantastic tandem. Um and the Rover is a fantastic tandem, and we are carrying through with those. But the numbers are relatively low compared to everything else we sell in our line. So sorry about the miss, but yes, they're continuing. They aren't going away. So All right. that will stay in the lineup. And uh, I, I don't think you touched specifically on this. You were talking about some e-assist options. So uh, John Johnson wants to know about the uh, motor assist for green speeds or kits. Uh, can you, uh, yeah, can you address that about green speed and the assist? What are your plans? Yeah, so just putting it out there to keep people excited with this. Yeah, we are prototyping that right now. I suspect that by the time RCC rolls around, uh, we'll have some uh, options there for people to demo should that event still happen. All right. And BJ replies here. Thanks. Uh, appreciate it. I do enjoy three different Terra trikes. So that is amazing. All right. Uh, I think we're going to leave the AMA. Can I throw, Please. Yeah, can I throw one thing out there? I'm surprised, but I want to go back to the Sportster. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the Sportster is going away. And probably the uh, elephant in the room, if you will, would be this fine trike kind of up behind me, which is the GTS. Uh, which we showed last year at Rider Fest in the Spider, and both of those have been talked about quite a bit on the laid back report. Uh, we've had some delays in, in Taiwan, and that uh, held up the production and such, but uh, we still expect to have those come out this year, just so people know. And there's a, I think there's a Spider, yeah, ATC yeah. back here behind me. But uh, just want to reassure people that those products still are. Uh, coming to market uh, just a little later than we had hoped. Right. So let's. Uh, this is the time I think uh, you've you've answered part of the question already to address the coronavirus situation and how it has affected you. Uh, we've heard from so many dealers already and talked to a number of them, including our own Doug Davis, about the yeah. 
the craziness at the retail bike shops these days in terms of the business that's going on. So tell us uh, briefly, we don't get too deep in the weeds here, but tell us yeah. how this has all affected uh, TerraTrike and what your plans are, how you're handling it. Sure. So we actually, I'll just use the word shut down uh, in, in March and didn't reopen for shipping until I think it was the second week of, of April. And then in May and June, we experienced like, we experienced record sales, which has happened, you know, throughout the bike industry. And I suspect with other recumbent uh, companies as well. So sales have been just fantastic. And, you know, I, I almost to the point, I think it's been hardest on the retailers. You know, these guys are out there sometimes working with limited crews and they've seen this huge spike in sales and they're, they're having successful months, but man, I can't tell you how many dealers I've talked to that are working 12 and 14 hours a day between repairs and sales and that sort of stuff. So as for us, we've done a lot of creative things uh, here. Most of us are working from home. We've gone to split ships in uh, shipping and uh, you know, we've done just fine with all this. So pretty happy to, to say that. Um, I think what's next is, you know, just trying to do everything we can to get product in as quickly as we can, again, for the dealers and for the customers. So whatever we need to do, we're pretty much prepared to do it to expedite shipments uh, back to the U.S. Very good. All right, let's finish up. I have one last question uh, tangentially related to green speed. It has to do with uh, we have many viewers uh, of the show in Australia. And I know uh, you were down there uh, when you were getting green speed evaluated and set up, Marshall. What can you tell us about the uh, presence of, uh, of uh, WizWheels green speed uh, TerraTrike in Australia? Give us an update the best you can as to the situation there. Sure, sure. So we've been in talks with uh, an entity in Australia to act as a distributor for the Greenspeed brand. Uh, we're getting uh, ramped up to uh, get them their first shipment here in the next, I suspect, week, week and a half. And we'll be making a formal announcement in a week and a half as to who that is. Uh, and Gary, you'll be one of the very first ones to know. Uh, <laughs> But that, that's where we're at right now, and we're pretty excited with that because I think it will go beyond just, you know, green speed in Australia. I think it will help us with TerraTrike there as well. All right, Marshall, fair enough. I didn't think I was going to be able to squeeze that out of you today, but we will hear about that soon. I think it's exciting news coming up, folks. So uh, stay tuned on that. All right. Let's pivot now. It's time to get uh, to the drawing. So let's preliminarily talk a little bit about what this is uh, what this is all about. We have uh, been talking about the virtual rider fest now for a few months, a wonderful idea and a way of TerraTrike uh, handling the uh, rider fest, which was at one time uh, an actual, uh, event in various places, and that's what it was supposed to be. Can you tell us uh, briefly, Marshall, what Rider Fest uh, uh, became, the virtual Rider Fest, how that happened, and uh, and and tell us uh, what, tell us about uh, how successful it was. Sure. So Rider Fest really started, you know, six seven years ago, with just a event here in Grand Rapids, and it was a ride that. You know, it was an event that we had people from oh, all over. I almost hate to say how far people would travel to do our local Rider Fest. Um, but we would attract around 100 people annually for that. Um, last year, we took a little bit of a break from having it and made it less formal. And this year, we decided to go bigger and take it on the road. And our plan was to have an event in Atlanta, to have an event in Cleveland, to have an event in uh, Minneapolis and to have an event most likely was going to be in Omaha and possibly one in Tennessee. And this was going to be something where we filled up our brand new sprinter van with demo trikes and we were going to take our show on the road and have events in all those different locations. And then what happened? Well, COVID-19. So JC, myself, and one of the uh, other uh, teammates here at 
uh, Whiz Wheels, John Akers. I feel like I need to give him a yeah, big yeah. thanks. All sat and debated <clears throat> this, and it came clear that let's just take it virtual. And we decided very early on that, yeah, it, it's a shame that we can't have these events, but let's still provide people with a reason to get out there and ride. Yeah. And that's really what it was all about, to, to kind of serve as that inspiration for people to, whether they were training in their house using a smart trainer or they were going out independently, but here's a reason to get out and, yeah. and ride. And that get out and reason, get out and ride reason was to your name would get put in for a <laughs> raffle and you, whoever we draw today wins a green speed or a terror trike of their choice. So yeah. that, that was the inspiration. And All was, right. It's, a, it's, a, it's an exciting moment we're approaching here. So yeah. how many uh, participants uh, did you end up uh, having? So on average, 90 participants per ride. And JC, help me out with that. Rides. Yeah, how many people did all three rides? It was quite a handful. Um, I actually, because the last ride was yesterday. So went in through the 20s? All of that. Yeah, in the 20s. In the 20s. So, so people, doing rides people throughout yeah, the whole summer. So. Yeah, did each one of the rides. And I got to tell you, you've got <laughs> some of the names or some people I want to yeah. kind of give. Uh, again, just a little recognition. There's some people that has been so fun watching them, you know, the because through uh, Strava, you can see how much people ride every day. And there have just been some people that have been a lot of fun to watch them stack up the miles week after week, let yeah. alone, you know, the fact that they did the Rider Fest events. Yeah, uh, we have to give a shout out to the captain, Donald yeah. Dicer. If you're out there, congrats. You were doing great all every single rider fest watching you put in so many miles every ride and then just throughout the weeks we could see all of your activity and it's really cool yeah. to see he, he sticks out in my mind it was kind of interesting because i just i noticed every week the number of feet in elevation he would climb and i'm going holy crap i live in an area that's totally flat because yeah. i could never match it <laughs> yeah and also uh, marilyn and Dwayne um hartzer hartzler i hope i said that right um We've also seen you guys on the Strava boards, um, just regularly watching your activity. Yeah. And so, so it's really cool to see. Gary, this is a couple that lived down in Indiana. And week after week after week, they were inspiration for me because I'm going, holy cow, they're riding like 200 plus miles every single week. And they do it together. It's just, it was so cool. Yeah. I also wanted to thank um, John Elliott from up in Canada, um, another regular rider. And a cool part about Rider Fest in general, too, is we were having people submit photos, um, which was really great to see from people. And he was one that had a yeah. lot of great photos up. Um, so just thank you for that. Um, I'd also like to thank um, John Records. Um, he was another one just on our leaderboards yeah. regularly. We out there me. killing it. So. Um, and Jack um, Glansberg um, from here in Michigan. Um, again, we uh, see you on the leaderboard all the time. And I think that's been one of the best parts about Rider Fest is getting to create our Strava club and sort of build a community out of everything. So um, just thank you so much to everybody that um, came, came on that ride with us. And um, even though it's something completely new and different, it was still a lot of fun. And, we're just glad you guys all participated. So, yep, it was really fun. I did a couple of them myself. It was great to participate. Very easy to do. It's and you know, it's a great community. Let's face it; that's what it's all about. And I might say, you didn't say this, but uh, to be very fair to you guys, this was not uh, this is not just a, a whiz wheel terror trike uh, ride. This was open to everybody, and oh, so that was yeah. kudos to you guys for you know for 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 doing this for the community as a whole. Yeah, it, you know, so Gary, to that point, there, it was kind of neat to see the number of people that for one reason or another, because they knew somebody that was riding a recumbent trike or whatever, but the number of two-wheeled uh, cyclists, just total upright, not even recumbents, that, that joined in with this and, and <laughs> you know, were putting numbers up and making sure that they did the rider fast. Uh, it was, it's still pretty neat to see yeah. that community. And so I think that's another thing I want to throw out there. It doesn't stop here. We're actually talking about right now, I don't have anything I can announce, but there will definitely be something going forward and we'll continue with this and do something where it culminates in some sort of prize or something at the end. So uh, that's, that community. Yeah. Alive and yeah. I think we've got 200 people now in uh, 
our Terra Trike Rider Club yeah. group. So, yeah, we want to keep that going. Absolutely. All right. That sounds great. You know what? Uh, so to keep people from screaming at their screens right now, I know they are wanting to get this done. Uh, yeah. They've waited yeah. this whole show and we're very excited to do this. So let's full screenshot the, the whiz wheels guys. Um, if you could Marshall, maybe just an inch or two to closer to you so we can see that back wheel just a little bit better. And then I'm going to have, yeah, that's fine. Awesome. And now, yeah, why don't you guys before we we do the actual yeah. drawing, tell us yeah. tell us what you're going to do here. How does this work? In my hand is the master list of all the riders and all of their entries um, throughout the summer through the three events we've had, and then we put into an Excel sheet, and then we took all those numbers from the sheet and cut them up individually and placed them here inside the wheel cover of the Green Speed Arrow. So, so if you did any of our Rider Fest events, your name is associated with the number, and this is filled full of little tiny pieces of paper with those numbers on it. And there's a little cover over this carbon fiber cover here. And JC's going to spin the wheel. He's going to take this cover off. It's got some tape on the back side, and we're crossing our fingers. We've tested this number of times. It okay. seems to always work, so I'm hoping it doesn't fail us now. And whose ever number is stuck to that little disc, well, they get to pick, choose whatever Terra Trike or Green Speed they uh, want. All right. Let's so turn this. You want to turn that so we can see the part that you're going to go. Oh, you got to spin it this way first. Okay. You yeah. guys know what you're doing. I'm going to let you go ahead and do spin away. There it goes. There it goes. So all those numbers are jumbling around in there right now. And then JC's going to bring it to a stop and give it a little bit of a shake so those a numbers have a chance to something stick to that piece of tape. All right. Popping that cover off now. Here we go. All right. All right. Sorry, it's a little bit stuck on here. Coming off now. I had to go through some really sticky gorilla tape. All right. <laughs> it's working. <laughs> they they weren't sticking there for a little bit. 91. 91 is the winning oh, number. 191. 191. 191 is the winning number. All right. We'll do our sheet here. Kind of like Powerball here. All right. And we have from Colorado, BJ Ando. BJ Ando. <laughs> BJ Ando asked those questions. That's I don't know. BJ, are you are BJ, are you still on the live chat? If you are, oh let us know that you're on the chat. And uh we might yeah, this is, a lot. <laughs> that <laughs> is amazing. We were just talking about yeah. he has some great questions too. Yeah. All right. Um well. I don't know if he's going to be on there, but anyways, well, that's great. I'm so glad that it happens to be one of our viewers as well. Congratulations yeah, to and BJ Honor. Go ahead. Hopefully that's the same BJ. So yeah, he doesn't look like he's listening, but with this, they would send in their, well, you know how it works, Gary. So Guess what? Guess wow. what, Marshall? <laughs> BJ, congratulations, man. That is, that is so great. Uh, what do you have to say? What do you have to say to BJ guys? Oh, uh, that is Just cool. Wow, congrats, BJ. And thanks for the support of yeah. uh, the Rider Fest. Really appreciate it. So awesome that it's somebody yeah. that we kind of have watched <laughs> on the on the score list, if you will, in yeah. Strava. So and, uh, he was also one that rode all three Rider Fests. So yeah, um, it's, it's cool to see wow. those rides. Wow, awesome. So BJ, yeah, you can reach out to us the same way uh, through the um, marketing at terratrike.com. Uh, I'm easy to find my emails uh, under resources uh, on the Terratrike website. Uh, it's just Marshall at Terratrike.com and that'll get to me. But either way, we will reach out to you if you don't reach out to us first. Congrats. And Look at all everybody that. for wow. everybody's support and riding with us. Um, like yeah. we said, we're going to keep the community alive with other fun stuff. So um, be sure to stay tuned. Oh, there's Donald there. 
Yeah. yeah. Oh. DJ says thanks. So, and lots of congratulations yeah. coming in on the live chat. So, and yeah, you know what? And uh, Mark, that's a really good point. BJ, we are definitely going to want to know what you choose uh, yeah. when you when you choose your trike. So maybe Marshall, let us know, or BJ, maybe we'll have you on real quickly if you'd like, and we will follow up. Uh, maybe on the next show and see how this all turns out. Or maybe we'll get a shot of him when he gets his trike and we'll put that on too. So, all right. Uh, is that about it for you guys? Hey, Gary, thanks for, <laughs> for doing this for you. It's lots of fun. Uh, really appreciate it. Yeah, we're, we're, we're good to sign off. It was Okay. It was great fun. Uh, what a, what a yeah. great opportunity and so great that, uh, that we had the winner uh, actually watching at the time. That was, that was <laughs> superb. All right. So yeah, Marshall and JC, thank you so much uh, for coming on the show for everything you do uh, for your sponsorship. You guys are awesome. It's, yeah. You're you're a great part of what we do at the laid back bike report. So thanks guys. You yeah, thank you, Gary. All right. We Gary. will see you back to me guys. And we are going to, wrap up the show here. Uh, wow. What a show it's been. All right. Let's jump to our sponsor. Thanks here before we finish up completely. We have some people to thank. And first of all, it is TerraCycle. From fairings to headrests, whatever accessory you need, Pat and crew have you covered. And Trailside.bike. If you find yourself in Florida, near the Withlacoochee Trail, stop in to see Andrew and his crew. And Cruise Bike, their patented race and record-proven front-wheel drive geometry changes the rules of cycling. Now, comfort doesn't come at the cost of performance, but fair warning, your cheeks may hurt from smiling. And our good pals at TerraTrike. Wherever your ride leads, TerraTrike has a trike to take you there, including KMX carts and now Green Speed, known for performance through innovation. And the Hostel Shop. Established in 1974, the Hostel Shop leads the way in providing recumbent bikes and trikes to cyclists across the nation. With over four decades of industry knowledge and cycling experience, we're more than just another bike shop. All right, guys, I want to finish up with an announcement. I contacted uh, Chuck Coyne, my good buddy that ru that runs the uh, Recumbent Cycle Con every year. I'd had so many people calling and uh, messaging me asking what's going to be going on with Cycle Con this year. It is in October. Uh, I reached out to Chuck and he was uh, kind enough to respond to me. Let me just read to you what he says. Plans for the 2020 Recumbent Cycle Con, October 9 through 11 at the Montgomery County Fairgrounds in Dayton, Ohio, are on track. We are monitoring the guidance being provided by the official channels in Ohio and will be adhering to them as we plan. We do expect that social distancing may still be part of the responsible Restart Ohio guidelines for the show, so we may have a limit on the number of attendees allowed in the exhibit hall at one time. As we can all see, most societal aspects of the virus are fluid and its effects and how we will be uh, interacting in the future may change between now and the show. We will see what the future holds and in the meantime are still very optimistic that we will have a 2020 recumbent cycle con. So, you know, I, I guess we're going to say that for now, the plans uh, are uh, are to have the uh, cycle con and uh, hopefully it will maintain that way. We will keep you guys uh, updated on that, but hopefully we will see. It's a long way till October, so we'll just have to wait and see. All right. The next laid back bike report will be two weeks, July 12th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, we have a couple things lined up at the moment. First, uh, Mike Lecca with the Velo Tilt. Now, we had Mike scheduled uh, earlier this month, and he is actually waiting for this Velo Tilt developed in uh, Holland. For those of you who don't know the uh, story behind this, uh, really uh, highly technical tilting trike Velomobile, and uh, Mike is taking over the development of this, having it shipped uh, to him here in the U.S., uh, it's in transit. He it, it, The current uh, status is that it's supposed to be there in uh, mid-July. The show is July 12th. So we'll see. Uh, if it doesn't come, we'll, we'll postpone Mike a little later and get something else on because we want him to actually have it when we have him on. So 
we look forward to that. Hopefully it'll be there. Mike Lecca and the Velo Tilt and a new segment uh, that we're going to start with uh, our good friend Jane Knight. Uh, many of you know Jane as a, a super advocate for recumbents, especially uh, senior games and the Arkansas senior games. Uh, she is a great uh, uh, advocate for all those things and women riding. And she wants to do a segment on women who ride recumbent. And so we'll see how that goes. She is going to be on and talk to us about some issues of women riding recumbent and uh, some of the special aspects of riding. Uh, for women. So we look forward to having her on as well. So that's kind of fluid, but we'll see what happens uh, on July 12th and look forward to seeing you all then. Bend Expo update. Uh, we've got cruise bike uh, was the latest one. We still have uh, TerraCycle, Haza, Catrike, and I think maybe even uh, TerraTrike we'll have on as well. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Hey, how can you support the laid back bike reports? You might be asking. I hope you are. So you can uh, like us on Facebook. You can uh, subscribe to us on our YouTube channel. You can click the little white eye uh, that pops up there and head to our website. And you can become a Patreon patron. You can see the uh, orange P symbols that we have there. Uh, these are folks who have uh, joined as patrons and you can do that. Support us for as little as uh, $1 a month. So Obviously, that would be greatly appreciated, guys. So thank you to all of our Patreon uh, patrons. All right. Uh, I want to thank uh, my panelists, and of course, my guests that were on today. Panelists, come on up. Uh, let's say uh, a last little goodbye. You guys were great. That uh, I think this is a record-breaking show. Uh, you might have noticed that some of the guys I introduced to you earlier have aged uh, noticeably. Uh, since that uh, <laughs> first part of the show. Guys, thanks for sticking with us. That, that was a marathon session, but uh, really, what a great show that was. Thanks a lot. We appreciate your help. Everything uh, from moderating the chat. Uh, thanks a lot, guys. We really appreciate that. Let's go ahead and finish it up. Okay, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. So thanks. All right. Uh, one last th thank you to uh, Brian Ball and Bent Ryder, Larry Varney, for all their promotional support, we sure uh, we sure want to thank them, and uh, of course, I want to thank all of you who uh, join us for every webcast, for watching and uh, supporting the Laid Back Bike Report. Thanks a lot for watching, guys. So, until our next webcast, from all of us here at the Laid Back Bike Report, so long, bent riders.